Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Dute, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello, everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today with our guest, Paul Martin, who is a highly respected psychologist who is renowned for his clinical expertise in working with bereaved clients. We're going to be discussing today all about rituals and how they can support us during this time of grief. Paul has authored a compelling book on the profound impacts on that very topic, which explores how unique expressions of loss and meaningful acts of mourning can guide individuals through the grieving process. With his wealth of knowledge and compassionate approach, I'm certain he'll share his invaluable insights into the intricate journey of grief and healing and how rituals can help. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. I know when we spoke last, we had a, a really a deep and rich conversation, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to come back into that space again. Yeah. And I think I we spoke about how we've lost a lot of the rituals that perhaps parents or ancient civilizations before um, use them uh, to be able to bring comfort at this particular time. Um, and I'm hoping you might be able to um, add your expertise as to why we need them and what made you write the book now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good place to start the conversation because rituals are certainly still present in modern society, whether we look into disparate corners of the globe or our own Western culture. Um, but yeah, they are in many ways not quite as robust and available as they perhaps once were. Um, the, the, the best way I've been able to make sense of why that is, is that it boils down to a, a few things. Um, first of all, in Western cultures, uh, America in particular, I think we seem to have a rather fearful attitude and relationship with death. Um, this is best exemplified in the fact that the bereaved don't really interact with our deceased loved ones in any kind of intimate way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hands off. We take a rather passive role in the process of letting the doctors slide in, letting the funeral directors, uh, you know, take care of the dead, clothe them, bury them. And that renders us rather passive and uninvolved in the process of anything ritualistic. Um, secondly, for a lot of cultures, not all cultures, but certainly a lot of Western cultures, yeah. the process of grieving a loss and any kind of ritual that might accompany that process tends to be rather swift. It's a little too fast. And so there are ritualistic things that are available to us, but they tend to involve no more than, you know, showing up to the church in the morning, getting lunch afterwards, going to the burial site, and then you go home and that's it. And you're expected to be back at work uh, two or three days later. And then lastly, I'll say, um, we are an increasingly nomadic society. And so we aren't close to our villages and our communities, certainly not as much as we used to be. And so unfortunately for a lot of people, what ends up happening is if they can afford the airfare, for mm -hmm. them, the ritual is fly in, 
dress yourself in black, catch up with relatives for five or six hours, go to the, you know, the whatever ritualistic behavior you were told to show it up, show up for. And then you fly back home and there's no regular contact with people to do anything mm -hmm. ritualistic. And then there you are feeling like cultural rituals aren't as available as they once were. Do we sense this sort of psychologically, physically, sort of, as you mentioned, we fly in, we spend time, we go back to um, our lives, really, don't we? Yeah. And it does feel empty. I know for me, there's this emptiness. Is that because we've not had an active participation in the process? I, in short, I would say yes. That a, a lot of what I discovered in my uh, in in my research, and certainly in all of my conversations with my bereaved clients, is that um, more often than not, even when cultural grief rituals are available, the bereaved don't really feel involved yeah. in an, in any important way. Right? They're they're sitting in the pews. They're standing twenty feet away from the burial site with their hands in their pockets, and they're. Uh, their hands remain a little too clean mm. throughout. And so they sort of end up feeling like there's a sense, a, a sense of what some would call stale ceremonialism. Yeah. Like, well, there was a ceremony. I showed up. It didn't evoke any feelings, uh, maybe a little bit, but I didn't engage in any kind of meaningful symbolic behavior. Yeah. And again, uh, I, the bereaved individual in this case, who I'm speaking for, Mm -hmm. will feel like I was just told when to show up, where to show up, what to wear. And then I go home. And then, like you're saying, Anne, for a lot of people, the whole thing ends up feeling a bit vapid and, and empty, like it's devoid of meaning. And it didn't give any real expression to what they're actually feeling after a significant loss. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking back as you were talking to when I was a young nurse on those long Florence Nightingale wards back in the UK and somebody would die on the ward and it would be the nurse's job to clean the patient and prepare them in the shroud and then the porter would bring the cart and they would go to the morgue and that was it. We had chaplains that took care of the mourning aspect and sitting with the, the families. And we nurses just carried on with our lives. But at least we had that opportunity to say goodbye to the patient. I don't even know if that is something that happens today in hospitals. Yeah, I mean, my, my best understanding is that it does happen a little bit, um, but again, the the window for that opportunity is incredibly small. It's incredibly brief. And then you look at other uh, other cultures, other societies around the world, and when you when you learn about just how involved they are with their dying loved ones and mm -hmm. how present they remain with them for days, if not weeks after their death, um, our initial reaction might be one of shock, right? Like we, we, we hear about people who, who wash and anoint the bodies of their dead loved ones. Mm -hmm. They dress them. They construct the coffins themselves. They put them in. They, they, they go through the, the physical labor that's necessary to bury them. Yeah. That all might strike us as being a little too involved and again, I never want to imply that any culture has it entirely wrong no. or entirely correct, but that was a big aha moment for me when I realized all of these rituals that I was learning about, which initially incited some shock in me, left me to realize eventually, well, maybe there's something about the process we're getting wrong. And that's why I'm shocked to see family members going through all of those processes themselves Mm -hmm. rather than merely being given two or three minutes to hold somebody's hand, say goodbye, 
and then all of the various professionals that you talk about slide in. And oddly enough, they're the ones that end up having these incredibly intimate interactions with our loved ones at the end of our lives. And we're told to do nothing more than, you know, go home, pick out an outfit that you want your deceased mother or father or whomever to be buried in and we'll get we'll do the rest yeah it's become a way of life here in north america hasn't it yes um, before we had the modern day funeral homes we actually had a parlor didn't we the good room <laughs> that was saved for guests and funerals for laying the, the person to rest there. I never experienced that as a child. All our relatives were in Scotland and my dad was put on a train and shipped off to Scotland and he did represented the family. Mm. But I heard of others. And when I was researching for my own book, yeah. I delved into some of the traditions and I just thought it was wonderful. I, I refer to the um, the Irish tradition because we're fairly close to Ireland. Yeah. And they would have a wake. And in some places, they would actually announce it on the radio. And you would see, you may not know the person or you may not know where they lived, but you just had to look out your window and follow the line of people because they were all going they were Absolutely. all going to support the family and the families themselves stayed with the coffin. I'm not sure if it was two or three days, but I know there was a prescriptive amount of time that the body was not to be left alone. And right. I found that to be comforting, to be able to be supported and, and have the time for your mourning, for your tears and it was okay right. because everybody in the room was sobbing. Unlike you mentioned, we get into the, the church or wherever the, the ceremony is taking place. Usually these days it's in the funeral homes themselves yeah. and you're sitting there and you're aware of it, but you're trying not to look at your neighbor as they dab their eyes or get some Kleenex out of their pocket. It's almost an embarrassment, isn't it, to show emotions? And I find that very sad. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much there to unpack. I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> yeah, a lot of cultures allow for nothing. They allow for nothing more than quiet, somber expressions of grief. Sadness mm -hmm. is allowed, maybe even encouraged. But you start to realize that in places like America, maybe UK as well, and in other Western cultures, certainly what I have experienced is that um, even the sadness that emerges is stifled. It's quiet. It shows up for three seconds and sort of choked back. The yeah. entire American funeral is an incredibly quiet and stilted experience and um and then you learn about all these other cultures where if they're going to experience sadness it's going to come out in full force it might even involve such loud wailing mm -hmm. that it that it serves this communal function you're talking about it's almost as if the ritual in some cultures is designed to serve as an announcement let your grief be heard so that all nearby households are aware of the fact that somebody has just died yeah. and it's time to do what comes much more natural to other cultures. So here's the other part of, uh, of this. There's something rather pernicious that's going on in cultures where everybody is mourning together and where everybody is expressing sadness together. And it's not immediately apparent, but what you find when you take a cultural anthropological perspective on all of this is that sometimes what's going on is that, okay, at face value, it looks really wonderful, even uplifting that an entire village or entire community will band together 
move in the same direction towards the ritual and express their grief openly. Wonderful. But what you start to see is that there's something rather curious about how everybody is experiencing their grief in lockstep in the same way. They're going to the same place. They're dressing the same. They're, they seem to be feeling their grief in the same exact way. And it, again, it gets at this idea that there is some kind of inherent tension between collective cultural grief rituals and the individual. The individual feels the pressure of, of uh, conforming to whatever it is that the culture prescribes per the rituals that they make available. And so in an effort to ensure that group cohesion, they sacrifice some element of their own personal grief experience mm -hmm. that might be different from what the culture around them is inviting them to experience alongside everybody else. And so I just, I love the example you bring and the example that you bring up and the questions that you raise, because it gets at this idea that, yeah, sometimes uh, we find ourselves alienated, like there isn't enough participation in cultural grief rituals. But the other side of that argument is that well, sometimes the individual's experience is tamped down under the pressures of a collective process that is saying, come experience your grief in the way that all of us are expected to to uh, mm -hmm. to be processing this loss. Yeah. So because there's different um, mourning types, isn't there? Some mm -hmm. people are quiet grievers. Some do better if they are busy. Right. Uh, yeah, we'll judge them because they're being busy. They're not taking care of their grief. But that is <clears throat> that is how they're processing it. And there's as psychologists, you would understand that better than I. So that addresses what you have just said. If we're following a prescriptive village style, mourning process it doesn't yeah. leave room for that person to be able to mourn in the way that they they need however do you think we've gotten so far removed from knowing how to mourn how to have our own grief ritual if the collective isn't working for us anymore. Yeah, it's a it's a great way to think about it. Insofar as cultural grief rituals um, stymie our efforts to grieve in a way that feels authentic, that feels in line with what's actually meaningful to us. Well, what what results is that sometimes people feel like, well, if culture isn't going to give me what um, what feels right or what is most meaningful to me and certainly what meets my psychological needs, well, then it leaves people feeling like they don't know what else to turn to. Um, and, and that in many ways is the impetus for me writing the book, Personal Grief Rituals, because I started to see one case after another of people saying, well, okay, some people would certainly say my my religious community uh, my, my, you know, the traditions that my family has, they're helpful. And, I, and I'd say, great, that's really wonderful to hear. But there'd be so many cases in which people would say that there was something about those experiences that was either unavailable to them, that was frustrating, that was lacking meaning. But then they just didn't know what other alternatives they had. And, and I got to say, I think the whole world saw this play out in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, right? All of a sudden, we aren't able to do the things that we've been doing for decades or even centuries. Yeah. And if you can't go to the collective cultural grief ritual, a lot of people quite literally found themselves just sitting at home, not having a clue as to what they could do yeah. to grieve their losses. And so I had already been writing the book and it, it really just affirmed what I had, why I had wanted to write it, because I had started to see a need for people to 
um, be encouraged to create their own unique mm -hmm. expressions of loss, mm -hmm. their own meaningful acts of mourning in those instances when uh, the cultural grief rituals weren't available to them. Oh, beautiful. So the book was actually already in progress when you were witnessing how people were going through grief at COVID. Yeah, I actually ended up having a few conversations with family and friends who were saying, it's a real shame you didn't get this book done prior to this. And I'd say, I know, I wish I had completed it in 2019 because the world really seemed to need it at that, exa at, at that uh, exact moment. Yeah. That was a particularly hard time for me as a coach mm. to help people because they couldn't get past the thoughts that their loved one had died without them, that they had died in pain. And we know that the brain is going to make up those stories. It likes Absolutely. completion, doesn't it? Yep. It left them, I'm sure, going around that hamster wheel a lot longer because they didn't and they weren't able to participate in that one small ritual that we still have of being allowed to be by the person's bedside, eh? Right, even even if it's brief. And despite all the things that you and I were talking about, about how, um, how limiting it is and how much mm -hmm. we have sacrificed to the professionals who, who take care of our dead, um, there was still some opportunity to interact with our, with our loved ones as they're dying and mm -hmm. after they die. And so, yeah, I, I experienced that too. I ended up having a lot of conversations with my clients who just felt um, absolutely devastated that they weren't even allowed that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so my, you know, the, the, the part of me that is and always will be a clinical psychologist starts to think in those moments, okay, well, let's try to figure out the specifics of what it is exactly that you missed from not having that moment. Yeah. And, and, and this gets into a big part of what I wrote about in the book. Um, at the risk of being simplistic, I think it boils down to a few big questions. Is there some way in which you feel like you still need to actualize the reality of the loss? Maybe that's what's missing about the fact that you weren't able to be present when your loved one was dying. Or is there some, uh, is there some element of emotional expression that wasn't facilitated? And that's why you feel like something is missing as a result of not being able to be present with them. And um, I guess the only other example I'll throw in is for some people, it leaves them feeling like, well, I do know that I need to say goodbye yeah. and I need to let go. But I, but I also want to figure out how it is that I'm going to hold on to some symbolic, somewhat you know, internal sense of connection to my loved one who has died. Either one of those things, or maybe all of them, can be felt to be missing when the cultural grief ritual is unsatisfying, or like we're talking about with the early phases of the, the pandemic, when mm. it's just unavailable to them. And then that, I think, provides a little um, glimmer of hope as far as my clients and I being able to work together to figure out, well, maybe we can create something more personal that feels meaningful to you, that meets your psychological needs, um, especially during that, that phase of history when the cultural grief rituals were unavailable to people. Yeah, for sure. What have been some of the concerns um, that you were hearing? Um, uh, just briefly, some that I heard was, I don't know where they are. That they can't place. <laughs> Not that I couldn't. Uh, yeah. I found that very abstract in attempting to, you know, figure that out myself as to how being there, seeing the loved one die, somehow gave them that opportunity to locate them. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? 
Oh, it, it makes so much sense that I'm going to have to be very thoughtful about not answering that question or responding to that for an hour. I, I thought about that a lot while I was writing the book. I yeah. wrote about it a lot. And, and here, here's the most succinct thing I can probably say about it. Um, I write a lot in the book about attachment theory. Mm. And one of the best ways I like to explain why it's relevant to the mourning process is that we all come into life equipped with relational instincts that are designed to keep us close and proximal to our attachment figures. We know how to be cute. We know how to express emotional distress that signals to our attachment figures, come take care of me. And once our locomotive capacities emerge, as we begin to crawl and walk, we learn how to solve the problem of separation for ourselves by moving closer to the attachment figure that we feel we're too far away from. Okay, and so anyone listening to me right now might wonder what, what in God's name does this have to do with the mourning process? Attachment theorists have been right to observe that there's something very interesting about the parallels between a child's reaction to separation and an adult's reaction to the permanent loss of a loved one. There too, we express emotional distress. We feel an impulse to go look for, even find the deceased. And that ultimately is an incredibly painful process to cry, shed tears, express anger, even on some level to go search for and look for the loved ones that we've lost. And what's ultimately beneficial, even though it's a painful process, is that it all serves to drive home the, 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 the bitter reality that they're, they're just not here anymore. Your loved ones aren't available to you and present as they once were that's a painful realization but it's a necessary one and what i hear in what you're talking about Anne, is that if people aren't able to be present with their loved ones as they're dying it, right if they aren't given that sufficient opportunity to see for themselves that this is happening i am losing my loved one they're going to find themselves sitting at home absolutely bewildered and, and befuddled as to what is going on. Did they die? Am I inventing this? Is this all in my head? It, it sounds crazy only to anyone who hasn't lost anyone significant to them, that you can sit there questioning, is this actually happening? And so all the more reason why I end up working with some of my clients to create unique opportunities to say, go to the site of where an accident happened, go spend time at the grave site, go to places where you used to interact with a, a dear friend or a loved one who has passed so that the reality can really set in on a deep visceral level that they're not here anymore. Without that opportunity, uh, the experience of bereavement is much more likely to be complicated. That in itself sounds um, to be a ritual. Absolutely. Go, go to the gravesite, spend some time there, go to the last place that you saw your loved one, yeah. Right, especially if it's done with intention, right? If you know that, um, like I, I'll bring up a few quick examples of the kind of uh, personal grief rituals I've I, I've worked with my clients to create. You know, it's... It's one thing if you and your father used to golf together and suddenly you find yourself playing a round of golf and it hits you, it's it's very sad that he's not with me anymore. Okay, that may very well facilitate some aspect of mourning. It's another thing to intentionally plan on going to a golf course where you and your father used to golf together maybe you even wear one of his polo shirts while you're golfing maybe you bring his clubs and that's all done with purpose i am going to intentionally do something reminiscent of the relationship we had and the bond we had 
Mm-hmm. That kind of thing is likely to be unavailable to that individual who's sitting Shiva or showing up to the funeral. That ritual might help to some extent, but they're sitting there thinking, I need to get into the specifics of what I did with my dad. And that and, and that's going to drive home the reality for me. Whereas another person, their personal grief ritual might look more like, I am going to go to the coffee house where my friend and I used to get a cup of coffee every Friday after work. Um, That was our routine. I'm going to do it with the intention of driving home the reality that my friend is no longer here. That's what I feel like I need. Mm. And then, yes, it very much amounts to something that is uh, 100% a ritual. I love those examples, but I'm curious to know how many individuals would be brave enough. Well, what if I break down on the golf course? What are what are the other three people I'm golfing with going to think about me? What are the people in the car? So it's fear that almost stops us from going and doing these small rituals that can actually, I think, bring meaning. If we look at it. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, Anne, I am increasingly convinced that the greatest constant in the work that I do as a therapist in general, and that includes the work that I do with bereaved clients, the greatest constant is um, fear is understandable and the subsequent response to avoid what you're afraid of Mm -hmm. is understandable as well. But at some point, we need to strike some balance of compassion, but a little bit of, dare I say, tough love, and slowly and and steadily encourage our clients to approach a little bit more of what they are fearful of and what they're worried about. Mm -hmm. And that certainly applies to the whole mourning process as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, let's talk about how confronting the reality of your loss is uncomfortable. Let's let's slowly get you ready to sit with and feel your emotions, including some of the emotions that may be uh, felt to be a little uglier or a little less acceptable, anger, um, even joy and relief in some instances. But the end goal to some degree needs to be that they're they're approaching what they're afraid of. That more often than not is the sort of the 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 core component of what is going to move the mourning process along. And conversely, if people are perpetually avoiding everything that they're afraid of thinking and feeling and experiencing, that's going to leave them stuck. Yeah. And um, I certainly hope to get them beyond that, not only by talking with them, but by actually getting them out of my office, off the couch. And into the world to do something on a very embodied level mm-hmm. that that facilitates that whole process. It's um, just the very fact that you're getting them to take action is is a movement unto itself, isn't it? You brought up um, a bit about the emotions that aren't necessarily acceptable. And I think this is something women have a hard time with, anger. Huh. Oh, geez, okay, yeah. I can't be angry that the person died. Well, why? Well, that's just not done, is it? Well, who said, you know? Um, so how do you work? I'm sure you've come across men possibly women that share that. How do you bring them into, say, a ritual to be able to express what it is they're feeling? Yeah, well, there too, there's a lot to unpack. Um, (laughs) What you do find is that in different cultures, there can be rather uh, fixed and rigid gender roles in the whole mourning process. And and those are woven into the rituals. Yeah. So, One of the more common examples is that um, men are expected to embody a certain stoic strength and women are expected to 
uh, you know, to, to give voice to the emotional pains of grief. Mm -hmm. There's something really interesting about that because you could argue that it's this bifurcated process of a, of a whole that everybody should be able to ideally be able to balance out in themselves. Allow some room to express your pain, but also make sure that you're summoning up some strength and giving yourself the opportunity to move forward with courage. But what you see time and time again is that men are assigned one role, often the stoic sort of affectless uh, experience of, of mourning a loss, whereas women are expected to be the ones to hold the grief and express the pain. Now, what you're getting into, Anne, is the specific emotions that were allowed, right? And so um, I'm not surprised to hear that that's been your experience, that women will allow themselves to express sadness, but if they have any authentic feelings that detract from that social script, they certainly aren't going to allow themselves to act on or express those feelings in the in, in, in the whole in the group, yeah. they might not even allow themselves to access those emotions in a private setting. And so that's, a, I think, a great example of why I came to be so passionate about this whole idea of personal grief rituals, because I ended up having a lot of conversations with people that felt like, OK, if we want to be radical, go to the funeral and express whatever you're feeling, even if it differs from the entire congregation. Well, that's a lot to ask of people, yeah. right? And so I started to feel like maybe the best that we can aim for is for you to go do what you need to do with your family and your community, even if that means that you need to limit what you feel free to express. But at the very least, can we carve out some time for you to express the fact that you're actually really angry. Yeah. Or one of my favorite examples, maybe you genuinely feel happy or relieved, or even in some cases where the deceased was an absolutely horrible presence in that person's life, maybe you feel outright liberated. Yeah. And that's what you need to express. But you're not going to feel free to express all of those emotions at a funeral. So we're going to have to talk about how you can sneak away and act on those other feelings in ways that you and maybe a select group of individuals feel comfortable, uh, you know, acting on or seeing you yeah. act on. Yeah. So getting them to express their emotions to you, that is a form of ritual in of itself. Yeah. Well, um, I think there's, the more I've talked about this, I've come to find that there are always going to be some psychologists and specifically some therapists who don't like my opinion on this. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Here's the short of it. I wouldn't be doing what I do for a living if I didn't believe that and, I, and if I didn't trust that there is something incredibly healing and restorative and powerful about emotional expression in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So if a client is in a therapy session with me and nothing more profound than just emotional expression in and of itself happens, that's great. That's good. I don't know if I'd call that a ritual. Okay. What I want to, the way I've come to think of it is that a ritual is going to involve something that's a bit more embodied than just sitting still and mm. talking about grief. That's important. That is a huge component of the healing process. But what I have tended to encourage is something that involves you getting up, moving, going places, interacting with nature, um, interacting with inanimate objects that serve as powerful symbols, or like the examples I talked about, golfing, going to a coffee house, doing something that really adds depth to everything that the client and I are talking about in the therapy session. That's when I think it becomes something that's ritualistic. 
I'm sure some people would disagree and say that the therapy session itself is a ritual. Nothing wrong with that. I just think we can augment talk therapy by getting our clients to step out of the office or out of the Zoom session or whatever mm -hmm. and interact with things in places and, and and nature in meaningful ways too. Okay. In other words, I want I want my clients to get their hands dirty a little bit. I want them to I want them to throw ashes into a body of water. I want them to 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 hold something that feels symbolic uh, symbolically meaningful to them. Is the I guess where I'm going with with the form of ritual is it to get a person in touch with their emotions to allow mourning to happen? What is your, I guess a better question is what is, what is your sense of ritual? What's the purpose of it? <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, I, I mean, the, the, okay. So let's just start by defining what a grief ritual is in the first place. A lot of different psychologists and anthropologists and counselors of various stripes uh, have offered different definitions. Um, what I've come up with from my research is that a grief ritual is a specific series of actions grounded in meaning about death and mourning that gives symbolic expressions to thoughts and feelings about a loss. Sounds okay. like a mouthful, but what that really just breaks down to is the action and the meaning that's behind it and the thoughts and feelings that are expressed in the process. Mm -hmm. And when we get into personal grief rituals, what I'm looking for is something that is personally meaningful to you, specific actions that have some kind of connection to the person that you lost and thoughts and feelings that are specific to the particular loss that you are trying to cope with. And then the question becomes, okay, well, what is this all in service of? Yeah. And, and so going back to what, you know, some of the things we were talking about earlier, for some people, um, the grief ritual that they create is in service of confronting the reality of their, of their loss and feeling it in a more visceral way. Okay, let, let, let's use one example to drive that home. Okay. Um, so somebody might go to a gravesite. Okay, that's the ritual they come up with. That that's the specific action that they are uh, that they've decided to do. Well, for one person, that might be in service of confronting the reality of the loss. They know that they're uncomfortable looking at the headstone because it's really going to drive home the reality that they're gone. And for another person, that grief ritual, that specific action might have different meaning and purpose behind it because for them, they know that I'm having a hard time coaxing out my feelings, mm -hmm. but I trust that if I'm looking at my mother's gravesite, that's going to, that's going to pull up the tears. Mm -hmm. Okay. For another person still, they say that they have created a ritual where they're going to a gravesite. But for them, that serves as an opportunity to say goodbye and move on. Maybe that's the purpose for them. And yet another person will talk about how they're going to the gravesite. And you're thinking, what other purpose could this serve? The same exact behavior might be in service, not of driving home the reality or expressing emotions or of moving on. Maybe for that person, the purpose is this is my opportunity one hour a week to still feel close to my spouse. Mm. That's why I'm doing this. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm not even really emotional. I'm just sitting there doing a crossword puzzle with my husband I know he's literally dead, but I feel like he's doing the crossword puzzle with me. That's why I am going to, to the burial site. And mm -hmm. so I, I find that to be a lovely way of getting at the idea that whatever the ritualistic behavior is, yeah. 
it can be designed to facilitate whatever it is that the individual needs, especially when they're not getting that elsewhere. Yeah. So for that person, it sounds like connection, connection with husband, just sitting at the gravesite. It just yeah. Uh, a lot of people are being cremated and their ashes are being scattered. I would imagine wherever you, you did that, unless yeah. it was it's some exotic holiday that you took and you wanted to do that, that would be a little tricky. That would be another way of them getting, instead of visiting the, the grave site, they could visit that place and it would serve the same purpose. What is... absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, what were we going to say? Oh, I just, I, I adamantly uh... agree with what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's you, a wonderful. You just, way to think you about just it. got my brain going here. What if people go, Well, they don't sound like rituals. I thought rituals were some kind of party or, or some kind of um joyous occasion like a celebration of life or something like that um are those all considered even though it may be removed from the death uh funeral those could be some of the rituals as well to to help bring the person some acknowledgement understanding yeah i mean what one of the main reasons why I felt so motivated to write the book is because I wanted to, I wanted to encourage people to be a little bit open, more open-minded mm. about what a ritual entails. Okay. And, you know, tradition is valuable in and of itself. It really is. Um, but if we cling to it rigidly, um, it, it deprives us. Uh, it deprives us of, of any opportunity to do something that might facilitate the mourning process, even mm -hmm. if it feels like it's uh, it, it's different from what we have typically associated with ritual. Okay. Okay. So that's what people can get from reading your book is a deeper sense and potentially some ideas if they are unsure of what that may even look like A absolutely um there are numerous case studies that i use throughout the book okay. to to exemplify different approaches that people can take at the end of the day i very much encourage i very much encourage my clients and any bereaved individuals in general in general who want to create something more personal for themselves to be as creative as possible you don't have to take anything that I wrote about and play it out in the exact way that I talk about it or in the exact way that some of my clients ended up doing things. Okay. But there are plenty of examples of um, how to visit certain locations, how to interact with nature in meaningful ways, how to incorporate symbols, um, how to even do things like go get a tattoo if that's mm -hmm. a meaningful uh, expression of your grief to you. Um, or one of my favorite examples, if what you feel would be most helpful is to destroy something or even burn something, that's one of hundreds of examples of what might feel meaningful to you and what might facilitate some aspect of the mourning process that meets your psychological needs. Okay. And so, yeah, there are a lot of suggestions strewn about the book about how to play with different ideas as to, you know, how to go about creating a personal grief ritual wonderful and if the person as you say it doesn't resonate with them it may ultimately spark some ideas absolutely carry out oh i like that a little bit of this and, and kind of pull it all together from a number of ideas yeah i would i i i would certainly love the idea of somebody reading my book and thinking that kind of sounds okay but what that actually brings to mind for me that mm. i'd like to do is something totally different from that case study or from what dr martin is writing about because mm. at the end of the day i i just hope to give people the uh the, the freedom to act on their experiences of grief and give themselves more of what they need 
even if it means stepping away from tradition, even if it means stepping away from what I'm suggesting that they do. Those are some of my favorite moments with my clients, by the way, when I throw out a sort of generic recommendation and in so many words, they say, that kind of sounds okay, but what I'd actually find meaningful or what I'd actually find helpful would be to do X, Y, Z. Yeah, and so then I really, back away and watch them create it themselves. You're just sort of the impetus to get the 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 creative ideas going. A little bit like a a, a creative brainstorming. You just throw out ideas and see which one appeals and lands. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Because one of the things I've found myself talking about a lot, especially when. I'm doing some kind of presentation with uh, with other professionals is this idea that I very much want to caution professionals against just sort of flinging generic rituals at people. Mm -hmm. Don't just tell your client, go light a candle. Don't tell them, go spread ashes. Don't just tell them, you know what you should do? You should write a letter to the person that you've lost. Those behaviors may very well be helpful. But what I've come to trust is that it's a much more helpful and ultimately healing process if you invite the client into the process mm -hmm. of coming up with their own ritual rather than just telling them what to go do. Yeah. So you're actually partnering with them in their own healing process rather than you being seen as the professional. You should do this, this and this and this. And we know that doesn't really work don't do we yeah that's right it, it it reminds me of what you hear about from people who specialize in leading group therapy the ultimate goal is to back away right the ultimate goal is for the group to sort of lead itself yeah. and i think a lot of good therapy as a whole including grief oriented counseling and psychotherapy has that same goal too i'm going to try to push you in the right direction but I feel like we're doing really good work if I'm backing away from the process and increasingly watching you create your own pathways towards something that's healing. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of something that my mentor taught me when I was going through my uh, grief coaching was mm -hmm. we had to write W-A-I-T, wait, why am I talking it was funny before I even knew it was an acronym, just to remind yourself, wait, hold off for a moment. I've never heard of that. That's great. Yeah. Why am I talking? It was a <laughs> reminder that you just sort of start, you facilitate the conversation and then you allow the client, you invite them in. Yeah. So it sounds like that is what you're doing with you through your book is inviting them into ritual. Yeah, because again, and I'm probably putting too fine a point on this, but um, cultural ri rituals are there and they prescribe the whole process for the bereaved, right? Mm -hmm. Dress this way, show up at this time, bow at this moment when the clanging of bells begins, uh, express this type of emotion, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what I worry happens sometimes is that clients retreat from that but then they find that they have, you know, they're, they've jumped out of the frying pan into the fire and the and the whole process is happening again as the therapist, despite their good intentions, mm. is recreating that whole pattern and just saying, here's what you should do. Mm. So I, I would I, I would love it if more therapists really, uh, you know, wrote the letters W.A.I.T. on their notepad and just told themselves. Maybe I don't need to talk. Maybe I just need to encourage them to say more and come yeah. up with their own ideas about what would be meaningful. Exactly. What a delightful conversation as always. And if people want to find you, you have a website? You know, the best way that they could find me would be to uh, find my profile on um, that that's attached to the practice that I work out of. Okay. I am the assistant director of the Center for Grief Recovery, which is a nonprofit organization in Chicago. It's essentially a group practice of therapists. And you can find my profile there by going to griefcounselor 
dot org. Okay. Um, and otherwise, you can find the book available through Routledge or through Amazon or Barnes and Noble or pretty much anywhere that sells books online. If you type in personal grief rituals, Personally. you'll see uh, a, a slew of websites available. Okay. We'll make sure, Paul, that we get all that in the show notes. So if people didn't have a pen or paper handy when you yeah. were giving out the information, they just need to go into that. Great. I thank want you. to thank you so much for spending this time with me. I always learn from my guests. I just love, love, love. It deepens my own education into this process. My goodness. So thank you so very much. And uh, all the success with your book. Oh, thank you, Anne. And yeah, to the one that you're writing as well. I'd love to hear more about that. But uh, like in general, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you and um, and uh, hopefully facilitate more of a conversation about how not only professionals can keep this stuff in mind, but how just people who are struggling with their loss in general, regardless mm -hmm. of what they do for work, regardless of whether or not they're in therapy, I hope that the lay public as a whole can find something meaningful from the book as well. Absolutely. So thank you for helping me with that. You're so very welcome. My absolute pleasure. Well, listeners, that's indeed a wrap, as I like to say. We have exhausted for now the topic of ritual, <laughs> just for the moment. Anyway, sure. Paul, again, thank you so much for being with me. And uh, we'll talk again, no doubt. Take care. Bye-bye, listeners. Bye. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at understandinggrief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.